بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. First of all, I thank you, Prof. Yasser, and uh, I thank you all for coming today. Um, really, I've been assigned to give the grand round a few months ago, and since that time, I've been thinking about the topic that would be of interest to general ophthalmologists and also something that you come up with a new knowledge, hopefully, after leaving this grand round. And I figured out that orbital hemangioma and vascular malformation is something that interesting therapeutic options have been introduced, and more important, the classification that's been now coming in the recent literature that most of us are not using yet. So it's a good time or a good uh, occasion to stress on this new classification, or actually it's not a new, but we maybe it's new for some of us, and be using them. Plus I'm gonna share with you some uh, interesting cases we have seen at the university uh, hospital, and uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll come up with a nice uh, conclusion at the end. Um, as all of you know that vascular malformation are very common findings in all age, especially in childhood, and it's been reported up to 1% of childhood, uh, child, children to have uh, vascular malformation. And if you look at the literature, most of what we uh, really um, do about these uh, vascular anomalies or malformations, we describe them that really uh, have them based in a scientific or um, a classification that give you uh, a good way of uh, managing these patients. So many descriptions are based on the appearance or histopathologi uh, histopathological uh, terms that is sometimes can be confusing. So we are really uh, uh, in bad need for uh, terms or uh, classification that make the things consistent and this will help to, pro to plan proper management for these uh, type of tumors. And it's been interesting from 1982 two uh, well-known people interested in this type of pathology, they propose a system that look at consideration, in, uh, that put in consideration both the clinical histopathological feature of vascular anomalies that will aim to help and facilitate the clinical management. So it's not only describing, it's more than description. And they put an, 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 an classification that help to guide the, the treatment and also based on um, uh, a system that include the pathology symptoms and uh, radiological finding. This, the, the system uh, proposed in, in 1982 was the basic for the International uh, Society for a Study of Vascular Tumor uh, System or Scoring. That was published in 19, uh, 1992 and which is known as ISSVA. And this classification, according to this new, uh, or actually the, the classification introduced in 1992, divided these uh, vascular anomalies in two components. Vascular component, or vascular tumor, and also vascular malformation. And here just I'm gonna give you how confusing sometimes can be the, the terms that we use. For example, for hemangioma, there are so many co terms that are being really used to describe these lesions. Like we have a strawberry hemangioma, strawberry mark, mixed hemangioma, capillary hemangioma, capillary furnace hemangioma, just hemangioma, juvenile hemangioma, serial hemangioma. And when you go to the vascular tumor, or vascular malformation, sorry, you see that port wine stain, port wine hemangioma, cavernous malformation, and it's not like consistent way of using a classification that all of us are understand and use. So this like we see it, the need for using a classification that all of us are using so we can s speak the same language and also uh, present our uh, data in a, in a more standard way. So when you ask, when you talk about vascular tumors, that we, we meant these by tumor that have uh, a ciliar proliferation. And vascular tumors can be also defined in two parts. Hemangioma, which is described the a lesion that under, undergoes a phase of proliferation uh, involving high mitotic activity, followed by a period, bar, uh, by a period of uh, involution. There are other vascular tumors that we are not gonna really touch here in this lecture, but it's good to mention them which is Kabusi uh, hemangioendothelioma, tuft hemangioma, uh, hemangiobericytoma. These are distinct from hemangioma, but are under a group of vascular tumors. Uh, vascular malformation, on the other hand, these are a common anomalous channels of uh, the arter arterial, venous, or capillary, and sometimes a, misc a mix uh, of these combination. Vascular malformation show 
normal endothelial turnover and growth that is starting during early childhood and continue and not spontaneously resolute. So the difference between the two, we have capillary or uh, vascular tumors, which is the most common one, at capillary, uh, the infantile hemangioma, that it has a burative phase, then followed by a phase. And there is a mitotic activity going on in that tumor. Vascular malformation or vascular uh, channel, uh, vascular malformation is a kind of channels that have an endothelial uh, lining that is not under blurfative phase. So it starts early in childhood and continue to grow with the normal growth of the child. It's not like overgrowth or proliferation like the vascular tumors. So here's more again to explain what we have just said. So we have vascular tumors with infantile hemangioma, congenital hemangioma, hemangiobericytoma, hemangioblastoma, and we have a vascular malformation, which is a form of high flow like uh, arteriovenous malformation, mixed flow like arteriovenous fistula, and low flow like venous, lymphatic, or cavernous venous malformation. So these have proliferative phase and then sometime involute, like in the hemangioma, but these continue to grow. And these are endothelial lining normal, but it's not, it grows normal with the growth of the child. For, for accurate uh, diagnosis of hemangioma or other vascular uh, malformation, we, require, we really need to have two main things, the clinical and diagnostic imaging. For a clinical finding, you look for orbital palpation, ocular auscultation, and other clinical symptom and sign that most of us are familiar with. And, and if you have a case that is not clear, you need to go for diagnostic imaging, such as Doppler ultrasound, CT, and MR. Uh, it's, very, it's very important to assess the uh, flow dynamic of these vascular lesions so you can accurately know if it's uh, venous malformation or lymphatic malformation or arterial malformation. And it's this really nicely done with the help of the new technology or, uh, and advanced technology we have in the imaging, like the CT or CT angio, MRA, MRV, and sometimes you can go and use the uh, conventional uh, angiogram. And these are used for M M uh, CTA and MRA are used mainly for static uh, angiogram, but if you want to have flow dynamic, it's also good to use the MRA, which which called dynamic MRA. These are categorization and uh, based on the flow characteristics. So for the tumor uh, in, in the infantile hemangioma, in the burative phase, it's a high flow. In the involutional phase, it's low flow. Uh, and we have also rapid involuting congenital hemangioma, which is a high flow tumor. Non involuting congenital, uh, congenital hemangioma, it's a high flow tumor too. When we come to malformations, we have arterial malformation, which is having a high flow. Venous malformation, capillary malformation, lymphatic malformation, they all have a uh, low flow. And when you have a mixed vascular malformation, it's variable depend on the which type of uh, uh, vascular channels are involved. So again, just to stress that the terms of hemangioma according to the ISSVA is reserved for true neoplasm that arise during childhood, experiencing blurfative phase and eventually involute to, the, to, to, to some degree. And this can be divided again, as we mentioned before, hemangioma of infancy or congenital hemangioma. Uh, as a matter of fact, more, many or actually most of hemangiomas can be diagnosed clinically. However, sometimes you need to ask for imaging for three different reasons. First, if you are not sure about the diagnosis. Second, time, uh, second reason is to exclude malignancy of similar appearance to capillary hemangioma or ca to the hemangioma of infancy. And the third one, sometimes we need to identify the lesion depth and the organ involvement for surgical planning and assess the treatment response. Um, the histopathology of hemangioma can be defined to a prurative phase, which is characterized by high mitotic activity. Then after that, it will go to a evolutional phase, which is characterized by fibrosis and decreased cellularity. These cellular changes account for imaging findings that we are going to discuss in a few minutes. Uh, hemangioma of infancy is the most common head and neck tumor of childhood, and most of these hemangioma are not visible during birth, but they present within the first few weeks of infancy. Brutal phase, which begins early in, the f in, early in infancy, involutes, uh, and involves rapid growth and can continue for up to, for up to 10 months of age. 
This followed by uh, quiescent area, uh, quiescent period, then later on, involutional phase of a gradual regression that extends from six to 10 years of age. Um, the appearance of, of, uh, of uh, hemangioma of infancy depends on the location. If it's superficial hemangioma, which previously caused strawberry hemangioma, usually it's, uh, it's looking as, uh, it looks as a bright red in color. If it's a deep hemangioma, which previously called mix or caffeinous hemangioma, describe a deeper lesion that may be colorless or have uh, some uh, bluish hue. And this is just a strawberry hemangioma, the descriptive term, which is now it's infantile, uh, infantile uh, hemangioma. And this is infant, another infantile hemangioma with uh, bluish hue because it's a deeper lesion. Uh, when you read about hemangioma, there are several syndromes have been associated with hemangioma, like uh, Faces syndrome, kasserbach meritz and other syndromes. Here I'm gonna just mention two syndromes because of the interest of time. We have the Faces syndrome, which is a posterior vossa malformation uh, uh, for P, H stands for hemangioma, A for arterial anomalies, and C for coagulation of the aorta and other cardiac defects, and E for the eye abnormalities. What, what are these eye abnormalities? If you look at the, uh, the preocular and uh, preocular and auricular finding in a patient with face syndrome, you may find hemangioma, which, which is the where we are talking about it here. And also, the patient may present with strabismus, amblyopia, proptosis, ptosis, anterior polar cataract, optic atrophy from optic neuropathy, or heterochromia, or other or and refractive errors. Here, just a slide that uh, showing the face a patient with uh, phase syndrome. You can see the hemangioma in the, in the mandibular area. This is a posterior fossa malformation. You can see the brainstem. Here there is a hypertrophy on this side. And this is an arterial malformation, arterial anomalous, and this is extra uh, artery nearby the uh, internal carotid artery. Uh, it's good to stop here for, uh, for a syndrome that when you read in textbook, you find that it's linked to hemangioma, which is Kessler Merit uh, phenoma or syndrome, which is referred to conceptive or coagulopathy or thrombocytopenia. And it's interesting found recently that it's not as be been associated with true hemangioma. Uh, current evidence suggests that it, the, the, this colored raised cutaneous lesion believed to be uh, briefly believed to be hemangioma and the uh, Kasbach uh, Merritt syndrome are now it's a it's a it's a hemangioendothelioma or tuft angioma. So it's not a hemangioma. We mentioned about hemangioma of infancy. What about the congenital hemangioma, which is referred to a hyperbluritive vascular lesion that completes the proliferation phase before birth, meaning the child uh, is born with this hemangioma. And this is li way less common than uh, the uh, hemangioma of infancy. And there are two types of the congenital hemangioma. We have rapid infoluting congenital hemangioma, and we have non-infoluting congenital hemangioma. And the differentiation between the uh, congenital infantile hemangioma mainly depends on the history. However, there is some uh, feature that I'm gonna just mention in a second. When you talk about rapid infolution congenital hemangioma, uh, we refer to a tumor that complete infolution or rapid, uh, or more rapidly than hemangioma of infancy, usually uh, within the first four months of life, it, it, it become infoluted. While you know in the uh, inf uh, hemangioma of infancy, it takes years to infolute. The non-infoluting congenital hemangioma don't infolute, but grow uh, proportionally to the child uh, age. One of important issues is to, do, to rule out other simulating lesion or other differential diagnosis of congenital hemangioma, which is include dermoid cysts, tuft angioma, embryonic rhabdomyosarcoma, and other tumors. Um, again, we mentioned that sometimes we need imaging for hemangioma, and ultrasound and MR are, the, are both are very reasonable baseline diagnostic tools for suspected uh, hemangioma. Ultrasound is ideal for superficial, uh, small size hemangioma. However, MRI is very good for deeper and more uh, larger in size tumors. Congenital hemangioma have the same imaging feature of hemangioma of infancy with a few exceptions. Con congenital hemangioma can have intravascular thrombi, large venous components than infantile hemangioma. Uh, 
What about the feature of uh, imaging in hemangioma? Ultrasound uh, illustrate a well demarcated structure of variable echogenicity. Color, floor dib color um, flow dibbler shows a high vascular structure and contains a, a, si a sizable uh, parenchymal component. Um, as you know, hemangioma are uh, highly vascular tumor, so it has a high flow velocity during birth phase and in the low, lower velocity uh, during the involutional phase. Unlike uh, a female formation, hemangioma don't have incre doesn't have increase in the venous velocity. Here's just an ultrasound to show you the, the, the well demarcated wall for uh, infant, uh, hemangioma of infancy. And this is a color double to show you the uh, increased flow during this tumor, uh, uh, in this tumor. MRI shows uh, uh, a well demarcated soft tissue mass. And the T1 uh, image shows um, homogeneous lesion with intermediate signal intensity during the birth phase and heterogeneous lesion with a small foci of uh, focal areas of fat uh, replacement during the involutional phase. In, in TT weighted imaging, the lesion appears homogeneous with moderately hyper intense uh, during the birth phase and more heterogeneous while uh, involuting uh, stage. In contrast, uh, C, in the contrast uh, MRI, the, the hemangioma enhanced homogeneously and a really marked enhancement appears in these tumors. And again, in the relative phase, the uh, MRA or a phenogram may show large feeding arterial or large draining veins. Here is just MRI to show this is a T1, a T2, and you can see the hyperintensity in the T2. And this is T1 with a contrast, and you can see the marked enhancement. This is in the axial, and this is in the coronal cut. In CT scan, these lesions also appear homogeneous with and isotens to the muscle in the birth of phase and heterogeneous with areas of low attenuation in the involutional phase because of the fat replacement within the, the mass itself. The CT scan shows uh, uh, uniform uh, enhancement like an MRI. It's very important to note that there, in these kind of tumor, meaning hemangioma, the, normally there is no calcification or uh, filipolithis because these are not uh, a feature of this tumor. When you see calcification, you need to think about the uh, venous malformation. How, how you treat hemangiomas? As you know that most of hemangiomas influence spontaneously, like what we just talked about, and uh, sometimes it may, it may heal without any uh, sequelae. However, in the orbital and orbital hemangioma, frequently uh, we need to treat to prevent permanent visual impairment. Treatment option may include pharmacotherapy, chemotherapy, laser therapy, and surgical excision. And um, intralesional injection of corticosteroid is a common and effective uh, means of treatment uh, for promoting the evolution of this disease. Systemic corticosteroid treatment is typically reserved for a problematic lesion because of the potential side effect. However, interestingly, interestingly beta blocker have have uh, been and examined as a, fer, as, a, as a safe, effective alternative to, uh, to corticosteroid, and some recent publication consider it as a first line of treatment. beta Bracker interfere with the endothelial cells, vascular tone, and angiogenesis and apoptosis. Earlier, uh, early intermediate and long-term effect of propanolol and infantile hemangioma can be attributed to three different pharmacological targets which include, like in the early effect, like brightening of the hemangioma surface within the first uh, day to, th to the third day. And this is attributable to the phasoconstriction due to the decrease in the uh, nitrous, uh, nitric oxide. The intermediate uh, effect from the propanolol are related to the vascular endothelial growth uh, factor and, ba and basic uh, fibroblast and other treatment and other factor suppression. And the long-term effect of propanolol are, uh, are related to uh, apoptosis in the abrutive endothelial cells and uh, result in tumor uh, regression. However, uh, interestingly, I found uh, a paper talking about using propanolol even post uh, phase, meaning if you have a, a child with an age of five or six, still propanolol can give an effect. So it's not uh, something that you say, oh, it's out, now it's a, uh, it's outside the zone of relative phase, so the problem doesn't work. These are some patients we have 
you've seen this is a child with uh, infantile hemangioma of infancy. This is her picture pre-op and in the uh, before uh, at the time presentation. And this is her picture uh, like a year after starting the propranolol. This is another patient with the propranolol uh, deeper in the orbit, and this is her picture a year after with the propranolol treatment only. This is another patient with diffuse hemangioma affecting half of the face, and this is her picture a few years after treatment. And how quick propranolol working? We just mentioned about the three effects, like in the early, intermediate, and long-term effect. This is going to show you some um, like chronological order for this patient. This patient pre-treatment with propranolol. This is one week after, and you can see the improvement. And this is two months after. It's almost now opening her eye fully. Uh, there is some report about, about using topical treatment, and they found to be effective to, in, the in the superficial form of uh, hemangioma. A uh, question comes usually when you treat patients with propranolol from the other doctors, also from the patient family. For how long do you continue propranolol treatment? Which is a good question. I, I don't think there is a, a final answer yet. However, what we can tell the family is that whenever there is a complete resolution, you can stop it. And other, uh, other option that they need to continue it till, uh, till they pass the operative phase. What about combining two treatment options, steroid with the propranolol? Personally, I have no experience with it, and also there is no literature to support combining them. But if you think logically about it, it maybe have some effect. And I was talking with the Prof. Yasser about this option, and he kindly shared one of his patients with me. And this patient received combination therapy of beta blocker and intra lesion steroid injection. And this is her picture after a treatment. So we finished with hemangioma. Now we're moving to the vascular uh, malformation. As we mentioned before, this term is used to describe anomalies of the vasculature that present at birth grow proportionally with the child and have a normal endothelial turnover and uh, spontaneously regress. It spontaneously doesn't regress. This category includes arterial, venous, capillary, and lymphatic malformations, and any combination of the above. Vascular malformations are ca uh, characterized by the primary constituting channels. So sometimes we can have uh, arterial predominant or venous predominant, and this will determine the uh, relative flow velocity within the lesion. I showed you this slide before, but I'm going to repeat it again. So the vascular malformation are uh, classified according to the flow uh, velocity. So we have high flow, which includes arterial uh, aneurysm, uh, AFI, uh, uh, AFI fistula, arteriovenous malformation. However, the low flow, which, uh, which can be seen in the venous malformation, lymphatic malformation, and lymphato, uh, lymphatic uh, venous malformation. And each one of these have different categories that we're going to touch on in the coming slides. Uh, it's, uh, the briefest slide uh, indicates the importance of assessing the velocity of the lesion. So in able to know what kind of malformation you are dealing with, you need to know the, the flow during this, uh, through this lesion. So there are, there are major ways of assessing the velocity, which are the clinical um, major, like clinical false uh, alpha. Also, you can use Doppler ultrasound with or without false alpha maneuver, you can use also CTA with false alpha maneuver during venous phase, MRI standard with contrast, also you can use the dynamic MRA. Another way of assessing the dynamic or the flow, you can use the direct injection contrast in the, uh, in the malformation or, phi or through its uh, feeding vessels, which meaning you can use angiography or uh, conventional angiography. Other way of assessing the flow is a retrograde access through the venous system that drain the, 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 the blood from that venous, mal, or venous malformation. Uh, again, the venous malform the vascular malformation, the clinical presentation depends on the, form uh, the, depends on the location and the depth of the malformation. But by, as, as, as we know, by definition, these tumor or these malformations are present during birth, but sometimes they be become apparent later on in life. Also, the natural history of these lesions doesn't include birth of phase. They may grow in size with the growth of the patient. And there is some trigger factor for this malformation to grow, and one of these trigger factors is hormonal changes, infection, trauma, surgical injury, all can result in enlargement of these, venous, of, of these vascular malformation. 
again to stress that unlike hemangioma, vascular malformation can produce significant distortion of underlying bone, while hemangioma doesn't do that. In histopathology, these vascular channels have normal cellularity and are lined with mature endothelium cells, and there is no mitotic figures or mitotic activity like what we see in hemangioma. Uh, vascular malformation uh, can be defined in several uh, subgroups, and the first one we are going to cover is venous malformation. Venous malformation are the most common all from all uh, from this group, and they are the second uh, to the hemangioma as the com most common vascular anomalies of the head and neck in childhood. Vascular malform venous malformation can behave uh, as a distendable or non-distendable uh, lesions. Most common, most common lesion in, this, uh, in the non-distendable category is a caffeinous malformation, which we which called before our called uh, caffeinous uh, hemangioma, and you know we know that is not a true hemangioma because of the lining is the mature endothelial cells and not a proliferative uh, cells. Superficial venous malformation are uh, of a bluish color and soft and compressible. Some of superficial lesion enlarged with falsalfa maneuver and with high flow uh, status. In contrast with arterial uh, uh, malformation, uh, venous malformation should not produce a sculptory uh, brewery or, bulb or bulbable thrill. Uh, as we mentioned that it can be uh, distensible venous malformation, which, is, uh, uh, which have the significant uh, communication with venous system through the normal or dysmorphic channels. And clinically, these may expand with false alpha maneuver and decompress at variable rates depending on the inflow and, uh, and primarily the outflow dynamic of this malformation. They may uh, present uh, uh, with the painful uh, bouts of spontaneous thrombosis and bleeding. In clinical examination, about 60% of this uh, distensible uh, venous malformation have detectable positive false alpha maneuver, meaning like 40% of them with false alpha will not be changed. Patient with a very large uh, dist uh, distensible uh, malformation may become uh, uh, may, may present with enophthalmos uh, due to a gradual enlargement of the bony orbit and associated fat atrophy with time. As we mentioned before, Vascular malformation may modulate the bone, however, hemangioma doesn't do that. Here it's very, uh, very important to stress that you may see calcification with this venous malformation, and you don't see that with hemangioma. Here's just a, a, a slide to show you the distensible uh, dysmorphic venous malformation. This is in the early uh, phase of arterial, and you can see this patient here. And this late uh, venous malformation with false alpha maneuver, you can see the proptosis clear here, and you can see the engorgement. And here I'm going to stress this and see some calcification here too. In the venous malformation, ultrasound shows uh, a poorly margin uh, distinction and uh, with the uh, vascular channels that are sometimes uh, compressible. The region is usually hypoechoic and heterogeneous and can appear inflative sometimes. Doubler uh, ultrasound um, show a monophasic low velocity internal uh, flow with uh, identifiable arterial malformation. In, in MRI, it's very, uh, they have very special or important feature that can distinguish this one from other venous, from other vascular malformation. In, T, in T1 weighted images, these are, uh, these lesion appear a lobulated lesion. Uh, and hypo intense to iso intense compared with muscle, and uh, and, the, and the signal inside these lesions are hydrogenous, may, and this may be related to the hemorrhage or thrombosis appear in these patients. This is a child, and you can see this child has two components: deep component and superficial component with with the venous malformation, and you can see the superficial component here and also in this conjunctiva. When you look at the sagittal scan, you can see this enlarged, deep component of the vascular or venous malformation. When you look at the T2, uh, it uh, these, uh, these lesions uh, have, uh, they varied with the vascular channel size. In the large uh, uh, channel uh, size, they, uh, they produce a cystic and hyper-intense hyper appearance, secondary to the blood within 
uh, this uh, channel. However, with a smaller channel, they appear more solid with intermediate signal intensity. This is the MRI for the previous chart I just showed you, and because of they have because he has a larger channel, you can see the hyper intense appearance in T2. And this is his also uh, uh, coronal cut, and you can see the hyper intense in the T2. With the with the venous thrombi, it may produce low signal intensity in T2 in the T2 because of the uh, big uh, thrombus or clot inside the channel. With the contrast enhancement, um, uh, MRI produce a heterogeneous delay enhancement, and uh, and also there is something interesting about these lesions. They are not a high, uh, different than high flow lesion because they don't produce a flow of fluid, which gonna, I'm going to explain in a minute. This is the same chart. You can see the the channels here are connected to the cavernous sinus because this is the drainage of the venous malformation. What do you mean by flow flow by flow voids? This refers to the signal loss occurring with the blood and other fluids like CSF moving at sufficient velocity relative to the MRI. And this is uh, imaging to explain that. This is a T2 axial imaging, demonstrate the numerous uh, flow voids consistent with the very large uh, AV malformation. And this is the voids. If they appear uh, like a black and in T in the MRI because of the velocity within these channels either from blood or CSF. There's something I'd like to touch before we move, is something we call uh, aging blood in MRI. When you, when, you, when you see a blood in MRI, we need, to know the, we need to know the different behavior and the signal of blood within MRI. We just remember we talk about if it's a clot, the appearance will be different. If there is no clot, the appearance will be different. And this is related to the age of the uh, blood clot within the MRI. And, and because it's very important that you can find in the literature several um, way to help memorizing this behavior. And there is many uh, mnemonics for this, like I bleed, I die, and something like that I'm going to touch in a minute. Why the blood behavior is different, in, in, uh, depending on the age of the, uh, of the blood in the MRI? For, for example, in hyperacute, the intracellular uh, oxyhemoglobin it appears like a T, uh, isotense in T1 and isotense or hyperintense in T2, like here. This is a, this arm for T2 and this arm for T1. And this is uh, hyperintense and this is hypointense. And the acute phase is something in the middle. And the T2, uh, T1, T2, both of them can be isointense, but T2 can sometimes be hyperintense. When you go to a few day, one day to two days, it moves toward to the left, so it will be hypointense. Uh, in the T2, or in, in, uh, increase the intensity in T2, while it's uh, uh, is iso intense in, T, in the T1, like you see here. The intracellular dexahemoglobin, the T2 signal drops, and the T1 remain the same. When you go to more uh, longer duration, like two to seven days, it become hyper intense in T1, and still hypo intense in T2. When you go more to a uh, longer period, it becomes hyper uh, intense or bright in T1 and T2. When it takes longer to become a chronic, it becomes hypo intense or black both in T1 and T2. And this is just the mnemonic that we just talked about. Uh, I bleed, I die, bleed, uh, die, and etc. It will help to memorize the, uh, the age of the blood in the MRI. And this is an MRI to show you different blood uh, ages in this one. This is a T2 MRI. You can see the bright one because of acute bleeding, uh, hypointense here because of a chronic bleeding. This is epidural uh, bleeding, uh, by the way. Uh, in CT scan, uh, vascular malformation appears as lobulated as MRI, and it can be a multi, uh, multi lesion and it isotense to muscle and can infiltrate multiple spaces in the orbit. Uh, with the contrast, um, in contrast to hemangioma, uh, there is no calcification. Uh, there is calcification in venous malformation, but no calcification with uh, hemangioma. And we just mentioned that in CT scan, you may reveal some bone remodeling from this vascular malformation. And the contrast enhanced usually uh, uh, enhanced with the contrast, but it's, well, it's, uh, it's really of a variable extent because of the flow velocity during these, uh, uh, through these lesions. This is a um, 
the contrast enhanced uh, CT scan in a patient who presented with a painful proptosis that developed over several days. And this pain uh, uh, really raised uh, um, or originated from a thrombus within this vascular channel or this venous channel. And this is the thrombus within the region. How you know it? By the uh, peripheral enhancement and the uh, thrombosed pharynx. And this patient after just conservation or the same patient after conservative treatment it resolved by itself. Uh, how you manage venous malformation? In the distensible venous malformation, they usually the, the trend is to observe, and um, and uh, whenever there is indication for treatment, you interfere. What's the indication? It's a persistent venous malformation. If it's uh, if present with pain that the patient cannot tolerate, or causing functional deficit, or the patient comes with the frequent acute thrombosis and severe pain within these lesion, and if there is severe uh, enophthalmos or uh, there is a marked hemorrhage within this region. Uh, as uh, distensible venous malformation are uh, delicate uh, with a thin wall, are often more extensive than anticipated, it's really a risk to uh, rupture and problematic during surgery because it's not easy to go and define this uh, lesion during surgery. That's why the trend is more toward uh, sclerotherapy or uh, uh, glowing for these lesions than an attempt to go and surgically remove them. There are several uh, sclerosant agents that have been used in the venous malformation with a good success, such as bilomycin and doxycycline. And this can be uh, combined with something called outflow obstruction that I'm going to mention in the, uh, in the end of my talk. What about the non-distensible venous malformation? These are quite rare uh, f uh, type of uh, venous malformation. The clinical presentation of these lesions is typically presentation of spontaneous or rapid uh, proptosis due to hemorrhage within these lesions. And in some cases, this can be uh, can present with a mild, uh, only mild proptosis. In imaging, these lesion appears as cystic mass uh, due to formation of uh, pseudo capsule. And in imaging, these lesion um, in contrast, these uh, capsule enhance uh, partly or completely. At surgery, uh, the, the hemorrhagic cyst can be exposed and dissected uh, typically as a thin uh, mass with the, with the capsule that formed around it, or the, actually it's a pseudo capsule formed around it. Uh, what about the cafenous hemangioma, which is now it's the, truly, uh, the true name for, or correct name for it is a cafenous venous malformation. This formation can sometimes be multifocal, as in, uh, like in, as in the case of other vascular malformation. The hem uh, hemodynamic consisted with focal filling in the early phase uh, of contrast uh, injection due to the vascular uh, uh, supply for this lesion. And with time, there is a progressive filling in the venous phasing, and and which really suggests a modest uh, to minimum uh, communication with other vascular uh, outflow and inflow channels. This is what we mean by progressive filling. This, uh, this patient in early, uh, uh, in early contrast phase, and you can see the filling here, now it's a progressive filling. But you didn't see the marked enhancement that you see with the uh, vascular uh, hemangioma or other uh, or arterial, or arterial uh, malformations. Uh, this patient presented with a proptosis in the right eye and here just I want to show you the bone remodeling from the chronic uh, venous uh, vascular malformation. And you can see the bone remodeling here because of the chronic uh, nature of this condition. And this patient after surgery. How we treat cavernous malformation? Usually the indication for removal are significant progressive uh, proptosis, uh, decompression of optic, neuro of optic nerve, Hyper, uh, uh, hyperopia caused by posterior uh, ball uh, indentation and sometimes persistent pain. A small lesion without functional effect really can be observed and we don't need to bother the patient uh, about it. How we remove them? Usually the treatment or actually the treatment for these lesions typically is surgery and the surgical approach depends on where the location and it's really advisable to uh, to enter the orbit from the nearest uh, uh, surgical exposure route, to expose the capsule of the lesion, and to gradually uh, define the uh, uh, anterior and posterior part and extension of this lesion. Sometimes to help in facilitating the, the, the removal of the mass, we pass the suture through the lesion so we can apply traction and bullet forward. 
Sometimes you can use uh, uh, really draining of the of the mass so that will be shrinked so it will facilitate the removal. Uh, and it's it's the the mass. Uh, it, uh, sometimes you can uh, uh, bullet also with the help of uh, cryoprop, but uh, I found the suture to be a better option for me. This is a patient uh, presented to Dr. Hattan, and he nicely shared this patient with me. He presented with uh, hyperopia in his right eye, and this is his imaging showing multiple image uh, cavernous venous malformation, one in the right and one in the left. And this is after removing through the lid crease incision, and you can see the suture pass through the mass that help uh, retrieval or removal of the mass. And actually, in the in the cavernous venous malformation, it has a well-defined border, so the dissection plane is easy. And once you dissect the anterior part of it, the posterior part become uh, more uh, more uh, let's say facilitated when you pull the mass out. So it will be. Uh, the, the plain uh, def definition and finding will be easier. What, what to do for deep lesion, especially that around the annulus of Zen? Uh, these are very difficult to manage by orbital surgeon alone. So we need to combine these with uh, uh, neurosurgery uh, to have a better exposure. And, uh, and, this, and these lesions, uh, uh, these lesions that really uh, invading or reaching the cavernous Cafina sinus, sometimes it's good also not to do anything for them surgically and maybe better to go and do some other alternative measure like radiation therapy. And um, sclerotherapy also in this lesion uh, are not as good as a surgical option, but a uh, few trials have been uh, presented in the literature with mild improvement. Uh, this is about venous malformation. Now we move to capillary malformation. And the capillary malformation was previously called, or uh, the terms giving is port wine stain, or nephus flamus, and other names. Uh, the cavernous malformation, uh, capillary malformation, as, as you know, that present at birth and grow with the child growth. And color can range from light pink to dark purple, and this lesion frequently appears as a, a macular lesion or patchy lesions. The diagnosis merely clinically, and there is really uh, no much role for imaging in these patients. How we treat them, usually uh, treated by dermatology, and they use uh, photocoagulation with pulse dye laser, and this uh, showed some promising uh, uh, result for this kind of pathology. We move now to the arterial malformation, and this term gives to the, describe the high flow congenital anomalies, including the AFI malformation and the AFI uh, fistula. AFI malformation uh, uh, operates as a shunt to some degree between the venous system and the arterial system. And AFI malformation are char characterized by apparent connection between feeding artery and draining vein without normal interfering capillary network. In physical examination, AFI malform uh, malformation may be warm to the to touch and produce barbable thrill and uh, and also positive for auscultation. Like venous and capillary malformation, AFI malformation have a mature endothelium with normal mitotic activity. Rapid growth is not a characteristic of this lesion in the natural history, and hormonal changes, trauma, uh, partial surgical resection can result in enlargement of this uh, malformation. In MRA, these, uh, these three lesions appeared as a dilated uh, channels and also uh, delineate or indicate the dilated uh, feeding artery and draining uh, uh, veins. Uh, AFI malformation produce a flow faults, as we just explained, because of the high velocity within these lesions. Um, in the CT scan, it appears as hyperatrophy uh, at, at, uh, compared to the adjacent one. A conventional angiography shows a high uh, flow structure with large feeding arteries and absent capillary network and uh, large draining veins with early venous filling, as we just mentioned. Um, complication of AV uh, malformation can include pain, hemorrhage, and, um, and stroke. For complicated lesion, combination of endovascular embolization and surgical resection has been used for, with a good outcome. Other vascular malformations include arterial aneurysm and also arterial uh, dysplasia. 
What about the other form of malformation, which is uh, another common malformation? We see it's a lymphatic malformation. Uh, the orbit represent, uh, rep uh, normally doesn't uh, have uh, lymphatic uh, th uh, th uh, within it. However, there is some exception which include the skin, conjunctiva, lacrimal gland, and the perineural areas. Lymphatic malformation of the orbit, or previously called lymphangioma, are type of low flow malformation with a spectrum ranging from purely lymphatic to combined lymphatic with other uh, vascular changes like uh, venous malformation. Purely lymphatic malformation of the orbit are relatively uncommon, as most of these lesions are mixed, meaning lympho lymphatic venous malformation. Lymphatic malformation refers to vascular anomalies resulting from abnormal lymph lymphanogenesis, and it accounts for around 60% of all benign lesions of the childhood. Most of these lesions are present at birth, and, and nearly all are identified in early childhood. This is very important. I want to stress it again, because some people, they have the concept that lymphangioma present later in life. However, the true is lymphangioma present in early childhood. Uh, lymphangioma are characterized by structural abnormality rather than abnormal endothelial perforation, like what we mentioned for venous malformation and arterial malformation. The exact patho, uh, pathophysiology of lymphatic malformation has not yet been uh, clarified or identified. It's proposed that, that formation include abnormal uh, budding of lymphatic tissue, lymphatic uh, sequestration, and failed development of normal lymphato lymphatic uh, venous drainage channel within the orbit. It has been uh, proposed that expression of specific vascular endothelial growth factor unique to lymphatic malformation and not found in normal lymphatic tissue or other vascular malformation plays a role in the formation of this lymphatic malformation. The size of lymphatic malformation varies widely from a tiny uh, small lesion to a massive disfiguring uh, mass. Most of the lymphatic malformation do not spont spontaneously regress. In histopathology, these are made, of normal, of, uh, made up of lymphatic and venous channels with a stroma that may have dense lymphoprotive and smooth muscle and fibrotic hemorrhagic constitutes. According to the ISSVA classification, lymphatic malformation can be divided into microcystic, macrocystic, and mixed. The imaging appearance of lymphatic malformation in, in, in MRI, it appears like a, a, a subtated cystic structure in, in, in MRI, and the cystic component of lymphatic malformation have a thin wall, variable uh, T, T1 and T2 signals pattern MRI, depending on the content of the cyst. This is MRI with a T2, you can see the septum here, and you can see bright fluid inside this cyst, it's similar to the intensity of the Vitreous. Hemorrhage within uh, the lymphatic can uh, with the lymphatic malformation can uh, produce a visible fluid level with the high signal in uh, T2 T1 weighted uh, signals, and this is a T2 uh, 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 MRI, and you can see the fluid level, and you can recall if it's a bright one meaning fresh blood or acute, and if it's a dark one meaning it's a chronic one. Well, how it's behave with the contrast, and the cystic component of uh, these lesions don't enhance with the contrast, uh, but uh, vascularized internal septi often do. And this is the appearance here. You can see the, this uh, patient with lymphatic malformation with the contrast. You can see the septi and enhancing, but the inside content are not enhancing. And this is patient with uh, macrocystic lymphatic malformation. This is another patient with the lymphatic malformation and bleed, and you can see the fluid level here. This is acute bleeding, and this is chronic bleeding. And this is the appearance of the same patient with the chocolate cyst, what they call. Uh, we, the feature we mentioned, these are for macrocystic. What about the microcystic? This is a patient with microcystic, which showed the crowded septi, and like in this picture, which, is, uh, which shows a slight enhancement of the entire lesion, potentially leading to misdiagnosing this lesion as a different lesion, while it's actually the microcystic lymphatic malformation. In CT scan, it appears as a low attenuation of masses with, uh, with a thin wall and lack of contrast enhancement, except within the septi, like what we mentioned. This patient, you can see 
this is a bleeding inside it, and this is the ill-defined wall, which is a typical feature for lymphatic malformation. And you, said, you can see this also with the contrast. You can see the enhance in the septum. But the mass itself doesn't enhance. What's the treatment option for lymphatic malformation? Actually, the treatment options are, are, uh, are, are interesting because they are really challenging. Uh, and this challenge because the vascular channels are usually not uh, amenable to endovascular approach. You can at least reach the lymphatic channels through the venous rod or through the arterial uh, vasculature. And the region itself is usually quite in infiltrative, meaning it inf in invades normal structures and vital structures. And also, these lesions can uh, have a robust vascular bed, which can lead to significant diffuse hemorrhage that is difficult to control during surgery. And another diff challenging because an incomplete excision can result in recurrence as hemorrhagic blood finds a path into the residual uh, 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 end of this lymphatic channel and the rebleeding will happen again. However, the optimal treatment is uh, case dependent and can include surgical excision, uh, uh, pharmacotherapy, and scler uh, sclerotherapy. At this time, Bercutane sclerotherapy is the preferred first line treatment for lymphatic malformation. Surgical excision remains the treatment of choice for microcystic. The related one is conservative. Whenever intervention is indicated, we have three treatment options. The first one is simple drainage, which usually followed by a slow reformation of the cyst, so it's not that effective. The second treatment option is drainage followed by immediate sclerotherapy, which can be quite effective. The third one, excision, which may be very difficult because of the thin wall, and it's difficult to find a clear uh, plane of dissection for lymphatic malformation. What, uh, what about the, uh, the mixed type, the mix, uh, mixed uh, microcystic and um, uh, macrocystic? Usually have a more solid looking component and microcystic and macrocystic with some evidence of venous uh, component. They typically present with a slow proptosis. Sudden worsening may occur as a result of intralesion hemorrhage. Treatment option is combination of surgery and uh, sclerotherapy. This is very interesting I came across recently that physician at uh, Stanford University, by chance, they discovered that inhibitors of uh, cyclic uh, uh, quanisine uh, monophosphate-specific uh, phosphodiesterase type 5 can lead to involution of some lymphatic malformation. This class of drugs include uh, sildenafil, which is known as Viagra, and there is other uh, group in this, uh, other medication in this group. The, this class of medication are, was developed to treat pulmonary hypertension, which uh, they found uh, they, they do by uh, they, they work by raising the cyclic uh, quanisine a monophosphate level in the vascular wall, smooth muscles, through inhibiting of the B, uh, BD, uh, BDE, the enzyme that converts cyclic quanisine uh, monophosphate to GMP. And this is the, they report this finding in the New uh, England Journal of Medicine. This child was presented to them with a large uh, lymphatic malformation, and they tried using sclerotherapy for him, and this is the result after sclerotherapy, and there is some residual. And during course of uh, follow-up, they discover that this child uh, have cardiac failure or heart failure, and uh, as a result of that, the patient developed pulmonary hypertension. At this stage, they started the child in Viagra, and after that, they observed complete, uh, almost complete resolution of the lesion. And after stopping the Viagra, the lesion start to grow again. So they, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they link that to the use of the uh, Viagra medication to help the pulmonary hypertension. And after, after this publication, there are two case reports of improvement of lymphangioma after uh, using uh, uh, sildenafil treatment or Viagra treatment. And this child was uh, reported in uh, JAMA ophthalmology in 2013. This is the picture of the child at age of five months when it presented to the, uh, to the authors. They tried to use uh, aggressive surgical intervention along with the sclerotherapy to drain the lesion but with the limited success. And the age of 12 months, they decided to use the uh, sildenafil, and this is his picture after using the medication. And they stopped the medication, and after that, the patient continued to have uh, uh, 
good eye opening, good eye opening without sign of recurrence. So it's going to be really interesting to wait for more publication coming with this interesting treatment modality. How does it work? The meaning the sildenafil we don't know, but the proposed mechanism is taught by relaxing the smooth muscle, uh, allowing the collapse of the cystic channel that would otherwise become more dilated with and filled with uh, blood and lymphatic tissue. Interestingly, there is investigation and pilot study at, to evaluate the, the effect of this drug and treatment of, uh, of lymphatic malformation is being conducted at Stanford University and now is at phase two of this uh, study. The last one we're gonna talk about is mixed vascular malformation. Uh, which combination of vascular malformation and other types. These lesions can be divided in high flow or low flow depending on the degree of the uh, involvement of which lesion. And the imaging depends on the predominant lesion in that uh, uh, malformation. So it can be lymphatic malformation, it can be AV malformation and others, and treatment depends on the cause itself. This is a patient with uh, fas mixed vascular malformation. This patient present with uh, acute, with the chronic proptosis, and this is his imaging showing uh, some cystic changes or actually macrocyst. And you can see there is some calcification. And this is, by the way, this is one of Dr. Yasser's patients. Thank you for sharing it with me. And this patient was taking, uh, and you remember we talk about if whenever there is a calcification, this is indication of venous malformation. So the patient was taken to surgery because of uh, compressing the optic nerve. And when the, optic, when the lesion was excised, the, the pathology came with the uh, lympho, uh, lymphatic mal venous malformation, and this is his picture after the surgical removal. Uh, sclerotherapy is one of the treatment options we mentioned for lymphatic malformation, also for uh, venous malformation, and this is, can be done through the uh, percutaneous, as we mentioned, or sometimes you can cannulate the, uh, or actually introduce a cannula through the lesion and introduce the sclerotherapy through it, or sometimes can be approached through the endovascular route if it's a venous malformation. And this is an endovascular route for this lesion. This is a venous malformation with uh, expansion with falsalfa, and they used the uh, endovascular uh, route to reach the venous malformation and inject bilomycin in it. And this is a percutaneous. You can, use, you can see this is a lesion, and they introduce immediately a cannula to the lesion and directly inject the, uh, uh, the scler sclerosing agent. And this is a patient also of Dr. Yasser. Thank you for sharing this patient with us too. And this patient with the lymphatic malformation, so Dr. Yasser, what he did, he drained the, the, the blood and he kept the cannula inside the cyst and he injected bilomycin in that uh, cystic space. And this is a patient picture after uh, drainage and sclerotherapy. And this is their multiple scler multiple agents have been tried with the with the advantages and disadvantage of one of each one of them, and because of time we're just gonna pass this one. At the end, I'm gonna quickly share share with you some interesting cases. And um, we start with this child who was born with this large cystic lesion, uh, and uh, the we we are call we were called from an ICU to this patient because of dif difficulty in breathing, and they think that this patient had a mutasil. Well, and it's actually, uh, if you look at it closely, you think that's really a true um, uh, mutasil. However, when we probe him, we find the, uh, the lacrimal system is intact. So we ask for MRI, and this is his MRI, and you can see the uh, lesion that is diffusely enhanced in the, uh, in the T1. And we treat this patient with a propanolol treatment, and this is picture after treatment. This is another interesting patient who presented with the mass in the lacrimal, uh, near, nearby the lacrimal sac and was referred for DCR. When I touched this, when I palpated, it was, uh, it was pulsating, so I thought this is not a, uh, well, actually, this is not a behavior of mucosil. And we excise it and came to be, you can see the, um, the mass is not a, a fluid containing and came to be cavernous venous malformation. And this is his picture after. This is another patient that presented with a proptosis and compressive optic neuropathy in the left eye. And this is her imaging, and you can see a mass at the back of the uh, orbit. We excised this one and came to be a uh, non-specific uh, 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 non inflammatory condition. And interestingly, the patient went fine and recovered, but after seven months, she came back again with a proptosis. And when we image her, 
we found the mass again in the same location. It was a surprise because I, I was sure that I removed the mass. And this is just to compare. This is in October 2011, and this is in May 2012. And you can see the mass that we removed, and this is a re mass recurred again. So we, we spent some time to convince the patient to go for surgery again, and she finally agreed. And this is the mass in May 2012. And you can see the uh, cavernous venous malformation. This is the mass we removed in 2011. And this mass uh, and this case illustrate that sometimes there is a, what you call it, provoking factor or inciting factor for the venous malformation or uh, to grow. And the surgery is one of these uh, inciting factors. And this is another patient that, interestingly, Dr. Yasser and me, Dr. Hattan and me, we saw in the clinic. So he was thinking about vascular malformation or vascular tumor. I was thinking about dermoid cyst. So we said, okay, we need to do some imaging for this patient. And when we image her, this is her image. And you can see the enhanced mass, and Dr. Hattan was correct. So we excise it, and this is the lesion of it. So sometimes it may present and simulate dermoid cysts. So we need to keep that in mind. And this last patient, the patient come with double fission in the, in the uh, bilocular. When we imaged this patient, we found a mass at the end of the, of the nearby the orbital apex. And as, as we talked before, this one cannot be removed by orbital surgeon alone. So neurosurgery was involved, and we, through intracranial approach, we were able to reach the mass and excise it, and it came to be cavernous venous malformation. So in conclusion, vascular anomalies include vascular tumors and vascular malformation are common in early childhood and, uh, uh, and varied widely in their presentation, natural cause, and complication and treatment based on the uh, component of this uh, lesion. Uh, evolving and future treatment strategies for orbital lesion should be based on a better understanding of pathophysiology and use of common uh, uh, classification. Outcomes tend to be uh, very good, but we need to make accurate diagnosis based on the clinical radiological uh, uh, finding, and uh, proper treatment then can be initiated. And thank you so much. Thank you, Prof. Haibani, for this very nice and informative talk, and uh, you've already touched a very hard topic. Uh, I have a couple of issues here, uh, which I think the audience may share me with uh, will may share uh, with me these issues. Number one, the duration of treatment with propranolol in case of infantile hemangioma, because this is a matter of debate. And personally, I have some cases that I've treated them for two years, and when I stop treatment of propranolol, it start to come back. Other patients only five or six months, and when I stop treatment, they are doing fine. So. Uh, Professor Haibani, and I'd like also to hear from our colleagues in King Khalid, especially uh, I specialize in the hospital, about their opinion regarding the duration of treatment with propranolol. Uh, I have no answer. What I do is, I, if, the, if the complete resolution, I, give the, uh, I, uh, I stop the treatment. Then I give the patient like two months follow up and see if it recurs, I will come back, I, I, will, I will restart the treatment again. If it's gone, it's gone. Do you have any uh, predicting factors? Because the family, when you start this medication, and you know we have a lot of issues regarding the cardiac and the flush, etc. So for how long are we going to give this treatment? Because you can discuss with them the other option of intralesion steroid, because this is very easy for the family. Compliance is excellent, despite having these rare complications of in uh, central retinal artery fusion. Yeah, interestingly, when I discuss with this with the family, when they see improvement and they witness that improvement, it's mainly related to this medicine. They are really more cautious about stopping it than you, because if said, "Oh, I want to stop it," they were concerned about it, it may come back. They said, "Oh, we want to keep to keep it as long as the patient is tolerating it," and luckily, most of my patients are tolerating it. So, whenever I want to stop it, they said, "No, no, no, let us continue because we don't want it to come back again." Um. Yes, uh, Thank you, Prof. Adel, for this interesting lecture. Regarding uh, uh, intralesional steroid injection, uh, it used to be the standard uh, uh, treatment. Is there any still role for it, or do you think the beta blocker is now becoming uh, the best choice for treatment? Um, there is a role, definitely there is a role. 
But for myself, I start with a beta blocker if there is no contraindication because of the fast recovery and uh, and really marked improvement with uh, propanolol I've been observing the patients. If the patient is not uh, not a good candidate for a propanolol treatment, steroid is uh, I, I, it's, uh, my second option. And uh, we just touch on combining steroid with a propanolol. I have no experience with it because most of all, all patients I've seen recently for the last seven years, they're responding nicely to propanolol. Dr. Yasser kindly he shared one patient with combining steroid with a propanolol and he showed good result. Still, there is nothing in the literature to show that the combination will, how much benefit you get from the combination, but if you think logically about it, there, if logic, there should be additive uh, benefits, but not yet proven. Uh, what about the uh, central retinal artery occlusion? Because it is in the literature, but uh, did, did ever you see a case of central retinal artery occlusion from steroid use? The question maybe for all the cribblasty who are using this. Alhamdulillah. I, I, I did not, alhamdulillah, uh, see this complication. However, they mentioned that the speed of injection mm -hmm. and the amount of steroid being injected is positively correlated to the occurrence of central retinal artery. This is why if you have orbital li, uh, hemangioma, large capillary hemangioma, it's better to start with propranolol rather than to give 3 cc or more of long-acting steroid. Uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Diego, do you have any comments regarding this issue? Okay, first comment is uh, about, anyway, <laughs> however, uh, congratulations for uh, your uh, very, very nice uh, and uh, comprehensive lecture. Uh, about the use of the local injection of steroids, of course, uh, to me, remain one of the options, especially in case with a recurrent case after the treatment of beta blockers. And uh, probably I, will, I was lucky, but I never had uh, any uh, complication like a central artery occlusion. Uh, it can occur, of course, but even with the use of the beta blockers, uh, uh, can, you can get some complications, especially general complications related to the heart failure. Uh, so I think that uh, nowadays, uh, starting with the beta blockers could be a good option, but in the current case, I would suggest to use uh, steroids. To me, there is a, a still a room for the use of local injection of steroids. Um, Second question that I would rise up uh, in, the, in this audience is about the cavernous hemangioma. Uh, I perfectly agree that uh, it can be easily removed, but uh, among the experts, we have to wonder, when you face a patient with uh, a good visual function, without any visual field treatment, uh, with uh, a cavernous hemangioma in the orbit causing uh, a mild proptosis, let's say two millimeters of proptosis. Sometimes he, he can ask or she can ask for removal because uh, of cosmetic reason or because she is afraid, she's worried about uh, having a tumor inside uh, the orbit and she or he won't know what kind of tumor is. And even though we use the, all the sophisticated MRI scan, uh, we cannot conclude that it's uh, sure this is a cavernous hemangioma. So we can, of course, uh, agree for the surgery. But uh, after, I'll, I'll tell you that after, uh, in my experience, after to, uh, the removal of more than 200 cavernous hemangioma, in 105% of cases, you can get worsening of the vision, and sometimes you can get, in very, very unfortunate case, blindness after removal. So we have to be careful because sometimes the cavernous hemangioma have a very, very deep adhesion at the apex, and when you, as you explained well, I agree with you, you can uh, shrink the lesion using the needles of aspiration, and you, with the, you, with the helping of the cryo, the, the, the cryo you remove the lesion. Sometimes the traction you can do, uh, you can induce some traction at the apex, and this can be very risky. Anyway, uh, I don't want, uh, I won't know even your opinion about uh, the treatment management of the cavernous hemangioma. Um, 
You know, for uh, you, you're right. Sometimes it's difficult to uh, uh, to remove uh, cavernous venous malformation, and whenever you face a difficulty, that's me indicating that it's not only cavernous mal malformation, maybe some other component with it, and mainly venous, mal namely exactly. venous malformation. So if it's a pure cavernous malformation, uh, normally should be having a smooth, nice uh, wall that you can excise normally. But if you have difficulty, you need to think about combining, because you remember we talk about mixed malformation are common too. Regarding cavernous mal malformation removal of it's asymptomatic, you know, we do a lot of orbital decompression for cosmetic reason for thyroid. It, it, for me, it's easier to remove cavernous malformation with, with less side effect than doing orbital decompression for a patient with cosmetic uh, uh, proptosis from thyroid eye disease. This is the way I look at it. If a patient concerned cosmetically, and I have a tool that um, it's a the low complication and it's easy to approach, it's not like f at the orbital apex or extending beyond the orbit, I will offer them that and explain the risk and benefit. And you know, when you do orbital decompression, you, can, you need to tell the patient there is percentage of double fission, there is a percentage of loss of fission, and still, and still the lot of people going for orbital decompression for cosmetic reason. And actually, it's the most common indication for orbital decompression. Uh, actually, I, I leave this decision for the patient. I have uh, one patient who's being followed almost now for seven years with uh, stable, most likely because we did not take biopsy, cavernous hemangioma. The orbital apex lesion may be somehow challenging. This is why I do recommend to combine it with uh, a good face surgeon, ENT surgeon, because um, the morbidity is much more or less if we go through the uh, endoscopic sinus surgery, the access will be easier. And they may have some help from you up external just to push the mass to towards the sinus. But this is valid if the mass is medially located at the orbital apex, or if it is laterally located, I think it, 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 it is a dilemma and it's a hard decision to take. But if you discuss with the patient and they are happy with following them up regularly every year or so, you may wait. Uh, regarding the cavernous hemangioma, the uh, capillary hemangioma again, now we are shifting to uh, propranolol injection, uh, propranolol systemic treatment. But uh, do really evaluate the result of the propranolol in terms of uh, complication because we know capillary hemangioma, it has two parts, vascular part and the histopathology with a recent publication, not that recent in uh, stem cells, that they mentioned these lesions, they have mesenchymal stem cell, which is able to, perform, to behave and uh, lay down some fibro uh, fatty tissues. So uh, when we treat patients with propranolol, personally I've noticed this, especially if they have large orbital size, they tend to have severe esotropia that is difficult to be treated. Unlike patients who received uh, intralesional steroid injection, because you know steroids affecting both arms, the vascular part and the fibrous part. So still we need to evaluate those patients after uh, long-term treatment. I don't know Professor Haidani and Dr. Uh, you know, when you, when you look at the effect of propanolol, it, it has uh, early effect, intermediate effect, and uh, long-term effect. One of the intermediate effects that's been studied in the lab, it's effect on fibroblast. They showed that it inhibits the fibroblast uh, formation and also the, li the fibrosis process. So it has a role in, during, in, in that arm too. You mentioned about large capillary hemangioma or uh, hemangioma treated with the propanolol they tend. But w what do you think if you start steroid? Because there's no study to show that steroid will prevent and this one will not prevent. And when you have a large lesion uh, fading the orbit, uh, still there are multiple factors affecting this. It's not only fibrosis part, maybe a changing in the orientation and also the getting the globin position. Sometimes it takes time, so the visual development maybe not uh, helping much to align the patient, uh, align patient's eyes. So there are multiple variables in that, in that regard, so. Yes, uh, regarding the, 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 the use of the, uh, I mean, I, I agree, we already discussed <laughs> with, this, uh, with this issue. I think that uh, should be more evaluated uh, all the, the side effects and the complication that can be, that can, uh, you can get after the use of the, the this kind of therapy. I think that uh, one of uh, the issue that remains is uh, you 
the dosage of the uh, use of the sclerotherapy for uh, the malformation. Yeah. 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 So the bleomycin, and I perfectly agree that uh, it's one of the best options. Or even uh, the use of the operative of the glue can be discussed, but I don't want to confuse it with the discussion. So I think that we should address, because you mentioned many times uh, appropriately, the use of the sclerotherapy for the vascular malformation, uh, address a little bit the, the dosage, because, because I think this is uh, it's not well Stand. explained everywhere in the literature. And uh, if somebody of the fellows of the Ufobasi thinks to start with this kind of therapy, I think that they are a little bit, you know, uh, confused about uh, how, can, how they, what they, what they can do for, uh, or how to start with the use of the sclerotherapy. So some of you can give advice or tips to the fellows or the, the, the who, uh, or the physician, they won't start with this kind of therapy. Oh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Adel, for a very nice uh, l lecture. I noticed that one of the cases you shared with uh, uh, Dr. Prof. Yasser that uh, b b used uh, the um, sclerotherapy for the malformation, that there was a scar. Was it brief? Uh, am I right? And then was it previously uh, excised or uh, there was an ex surgical excision before and then recurred? Uh, yeah, there was a biopsy. biopsy. Only, biopsy. But it seems uh, quite a long scar. Is this it is only biopsy yeah. or this is a virgin case? No. Yeah. The child. Yeah, it was the incision for the biopsy. It's your patient. Yeah. Uh, only biopsy, not yeah. previously uh, no, surgically. Uh, no. um, re regarding the dosing, I was talking with Dr. Yasser. If you, uh, what's been in the orbit published is the paper by Dr. David Meyer. Most of us know him here. He published using one milligram per cc and you inject two cc. And recently, there is a, a paper presented in the Asabras meeting in 2014 and uh, by Kikawa and his group. They, they reported using eight milligram per cc, and they inject uh, around two uh, to three cc. And when they inject, they just infiltrate the area, even they don't need to cannulate or uh, isolate the lesion. They just infiltrate it like you are doing peripheral anesthesia. You infiltrate the area, and they report good result too. Sometimes you need to repeat it. It's not only one treatment. You maybe read two or three. That's mainly for lymphatic malformation. What's predominant lymphatic malformation? As we know that, we just mentioned that pure lymphatic malformation is not common. What's most common is lymphato, lymphatic venous malformation. And they've, they reported good result for this. Um, there is other uh, sclerotherapy agents being reported too, but this is what we, what we are doing, yeah. Like doxycycline and uh, bulimagensin and other treatment modality. But you know, because of the scope of the lecture, I wasn't going that deep in this area. Thank you, Dr. Adele, to share with us your experience and Dr. Alfak. I have one question about the, the experiences of both with propanolol in, in mangioma, about the complications that uh, you may have, systemic complications, because uh, as you know, we are not uh, giving for our patients here this, uh, this medication I use in my place in Brazil. But here, no. And I would like to know, because uh, I never had uh, any complication, systemic complication with my patients. I would like to know if uh, they, uh, in, in the university you uh, saw something like this. Complications, systemic complications by using propanolol. Also, I would like to know if you see something about the topic uh, beta block uh, to treat hemangiomas. About what? Uh, Topical, topical yes. beta block. Um, yeah, look, regarding the systemic, uh, Dr. Yasser and me, we, uh, we have, and Dr. Hattan, to we share, we have a protocol to start a patient to propanol alone. Before starting, we admit a patient, full workup by, cardio by pediatric uh, physicians, screening for all possible contraindication like bronchial asthma and others. And when we start the patient, we start them, uh, we observe them for 48 hours after the treatment especially after the giving the dose by the by the nurse 
And so far we have been applying this one for seven years. None of my patients had a problem, alhamdulillah. And I'm not sure if Dr. Yasser, Dr. Hattan had any problem. No. And we have treated a good number of patients. Maybe a year we see around 20 patients per year, which is a good number. Uh, regarding the topical treatment, you know what's been published in the literature mainly about the gel and the nylonol gel, but we don't have it here. It's not available, the gel form. We have only the drops. I've tried it with three patients. I didn't find it to be really uh, significantly changing the appearance. Also, the literature being reported with the drops, but with the patient I've used, uh, they have superficial hemangioma. I didn't find a difference. Do you try drops? Yeah, yeah, but it didn't make any difference. No. Uh, two, two comments and one uh, question. Um, I've never seen central artery occlusion after an intralegion steroid injection, although it's mentioned in the literature. I've never seen any patient with a complication from systemic propanolol for capillary hemangioma that we, we have been using for a long time as, as a response to the question. Um, but the, uh, the rebound phenomena that you see um, in, in patients once you start like uh, tapering or stopping the propanolol, I've seen like in a couple of patients. And I could not explain well. Uh, of course, whenever you put the patient back, they, but it's mentioned also in the literature that they call it like a rebound phenomena. Um, then you, you have really few um, answers or few options. I usually put the patient back on, on, on the propanolol and keep watching for some time. Uh, just one quick question, Dr. Uh, Adel. For the patient with a face, uh, face syndrome with a large facial hemangioma, uh, did you refer for laser treatment by the no, that's or just by propanolol. Only, yeah? Only propanolol. No, no surface treatment, nothing. nothing. Great, mashallah. Great. You mean this patient? Yeah, the one with the large, very large facial. Yeah, animal. it was very, uh, for yeah. me it was really interesting. Me too. That's why I'm asking. Like a result was really great. Yeah, this, this one. one. Yeah, just a propanolol treatment. And when you, to answer Dr. Yasser's question, I, 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 I was talking with the family about the stopping it. The mom was insisting to st continue because she, sh she observed or witnessed the improvement and she wanted to continue at the end. Bro, you know how to select your patients. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm lucky I'm getting the easy patients. I don't think this is easy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Prof, we have uh, renamed some of the vascular abnormalities of the orbit. Would, she, would they share the, their previous association? For example, would all the capillary venous malformations share the risk of choroidal hemangiomas and glaucoma, like in the previously named Port Weinstein? Yeah, it's uh, what we are describing now, because, you know, uh, in the literature, there is no consistent uh, classification. So people now are more using this system so instead of calling it one name and the other people described it in another name, we try to use one system. So Bort Weinstein is a capillary malformation. It's not hemangioma or anything else. So it's good. It's what we're why I'm presenting this grand round is for us to, mot to motivate us to use the common system that most of the people around and around more toward using it than using the capillary hemangioma, cavernous hemangioma. Why not to use the international uh, accepted uh, classification so we can speak the same language. Thank you. I answer your question or? I mean, uh, from what I understand that port one stain, like it, it's not the, to the full picture of the capillary venous malformation. I mean, capillary venous have more broad name, more, more entities rather than the typical port one. No, port one stain is a capillary malformation. It's not a capillary venous, it's capillary malformation. So I, I mean, would any capillary malformation would have the risk of choroidal hemangioma? Uh, you, so you remember we mentioned that we can have mixed malformations, we can have capillary venous malformation, yeah. we can have uh, AV malformation, so it depends on what kind of malformation you are having. So mixed combination is really uh, common. Thank you. I, I have no experience with the IV. Uh, what the, for the oral, we give uh, two milligram per kg. Oh. Oh. Uh, yeah, we screen the patient before. 
So we have a protocol to screen the patient before. And when we start the treatment for the first 24 hours, it's under observation. They check blood pressure, blood sugar, and others to make sure these kids are in safe, in safe uh, treatment. And, and gradual, yeah. I uh, observed the patient and uh, in combination with the uh, pediatrician and the expert of uh, heart problem for pediatrics. Uh, usually, by the way, we start at 17, point uh, uh, one seven milligram TID, then on the second day we increase it to 33.33, and then 0.76. So we start half milligram per kg, yes. then one, then two, after two days. To see how much it already yes. is. Yes. Thank you, Professor Habani. Actually, we, uh, we extended the grand round because uh, it is still oculoplastic, the case, <laughs> and the uh, MM uh, We didn't cases, have much so chance <laughs> to present, huh? <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you so you much for uh, coming to the grand round, and uh, if you have any question, I would be happy to answer the brain.